Awesome. Okay, guys. So let's dive in. Um, today we've got Andrew Bust Bustamante and uh, from Everyday Spy. He's a former CIA agent, field operative that has uh, that is now teaching the everyday person, the everyday man, how to um, uh, use spy skills to improve their life. How to use them to get the get a little advantage or a big advantage on the outside world. And today we're going to be talking to him about how to use the skills he specifically used in undercover work to connect with women better, to relate to women better, to get that a little bit of an advantage or that large advantage, depending on how you look at it. And uh, we were just talking before the call and uh, with Andrew, I've talked to him a few times. He's a really cool dude. I really enjoy talking to him um, about you guys stress so much over approaching a beautiful woman and connecting with her and stepping into tension with her and and uh, uh, relating to her. And we were talking about what he would have to go through as a spy. You know, you go out there in the real world and you do this stuff and you have to connect, you have to step in attention, you have to connect, you have to relate, you have to pull somebody in. And if you screw up, it means something. I mean, you get rejected, you go home a little sad, you don't get laid, you don't get that kiss, you don't get another date. He could end up in a prison in a foreign country. He could end up dead. You know, so the, the 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 stakes are a lot higher. And so what he has to do is uh, is he has to be on point the whole time. And I want you to think about that as we go through this, that that he has to take what he's doing very seriously and be fully committed. And uh, that's part of. Uh, so I want you guys to really pay attention how he does that and keeps himself from ending up in a foreign prison or dead or something worse, some tortured somewhere as we we dive into this so welcome to the call andrew how was hey, that <laughs> <laughs> that was a super exciting introduction man yeah, and, i want uh, that tension <laughs> <laughs> yeah no the commitment thing is so real the uh the horrible foreign prison is also very real but yeah it's really nice to be here smiling with you instead of dealing with uh dealing with that yeah it's probably a big career change isn't it <laughs> yeah it's but it was the right direction you can tell yeah, I, I would I would say so. That in my opinion, it would be. Um, so we were talking about, um, and I, I watched your video. You you sent over a video on perception versus a uh, um, per, perspective, and I think that was a really powerful video to to really look at it. And what we're going to talk about here today, uh, largely, is the difference between perspective and perception in relationship to talking to a pretty girl at the bar, to being on a date, uh, building a relationship, which I think is very powerful in my mind. When I when I hear the two, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of turning on the observer, this ability mm -hmm. to listen and be present with somebody, but in an unattached way so you can get the whole picture. And I don't know if I've got that right in the way you're putting it out. But, and um, actually, before I even do that, that, that was a, that's a really good introduction as to where we're going. But before I even dive into that, why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself so they got a little perspective on, on you, on your history versus what I just said, because I only said a little bit. And so dive in. Let's let's get a little uh, a little more information. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm excited to be here. My name is Andrew Bustamante. I am a former covert CIA intelligence officer, and I'm the founder of Everyday Spy. So my whole mission right now is just to take all of my the training, the experience, the network that I built at CIA and bring that to the everyday person so that they can have an unfair advantage in all aspects of wealth, health and relationships. It's an awesome opportunity for me because what I what I found when I left CIA is that it's a little bit like leaving the mafia. When you go to CIA, the last thing CIA wants you to do is leave. So they don't do anything to help you leave. They make it quite difficult for you to leave. And they also try to put roadblocks and barriers in the way to make sure that when you leave, you can't really ever say that you were from CIA. So um, there's just all sorts of challenges that go along with that that make it very difficult. And I left for family reasons. I left. My wife was a former was a CIA officer with me. We had our first child and we were just the, the life that we wanted as parents was not conducive with the life that CIA wanted from us as CIA operatives. So we had to make a hard choice. And it was really difficult to make the transition because the mafia didn't want to cooperate. So when we finally cracked the code on using our skills in everyday life, that's when we realized that it really was just a process. And it was a passion for teaching other people how to do it because there are roadblocks everywhere, barriers everywhere. And all they do is hold us back artificially. So that's kind of the, the dime store version of why I'm here. And I'm super excited to plug in with you, Brian, because you're on a mission to empower men to have the life they want to have, right? The relationships and the wealth of emotions and the wealth of connection that I have with my wife. 
uh, and that that we have that we were so invested and we were willing to give up a life at CIA. So anything I can do to help this audience, I am 100 percent in. Well, I really admire your I mean, it'd be really hard to be a, a, a spy and have a child at the same time, I would imagine. So I really admire the reason you left. That's a super important and honorable reason, to be honest. And uh, it's huge. And and so the average uh, and di diving into this a little deeper, the, the average client that I get is it, it tends to be on the nice guy side of, of things. You know, he has a nice guy syndrome. He's nice to a fault. He wants to make everybody happy, which is really good at, 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 at his core. He really wants everybody to be happy. But because he wants everybody to be happy, he's constantly unhappy, you know, unhappy because he gives of himself so much trying to be exactly who you want him to be that he has no sense of who, who he is. He needs to develop that. So we do a lot of work with that type of stuff. And I imagine the average spy can't have that. They got to be, they might play the nice guy at times, but they can't be a nice guy and, or girl. And, uh, and, and so there's a part of you, were you ever a nice guy? I'm curious. Would you ever have that? Did they break that out of you? Did they have a process of, of getting that out of you? Yeah. You know, it's, it's really funny. So there's uh, we do a lot with personality testing and we do a lot with uh, with building profiles and dossiers about people based on personality indicators. Now, I growing up, I was absolutely in that same nice guy uh, groove, that nice guy, uh, that rut that you were just talking about, right? Where you learn over time that there's a certain expectation, a social expectation, a parental expectation, a geographical expectation of how you're supposed to be where you're supposed to go to school, what you're supposed to study, you know, how much you're supposed to, you know, pay attention to someone's, whoever that someone might be, a teacher, uh, a pretty girl, uh, your neighbor, whatever, your grandma. And you're, you feel, you're constantly trying to fit into this, this box. And we learn with personality testing that that box is actually a box called a judgmental box. It's within the Myers-Briggs MBTI personality traits. People, there are some people who are naturally wired personality-wise to look for boxes, to look for boundaries. There's a square and they wanna know exactly where they are, so they just bounce off the insides of the square. I was never that person and CIA showed me that I was not that person. And the entire time that I was growing up, it wasn't until I hit that personality test with CIA that they basically tapped me on the shoulder and said, you would be a good spy, but the first thing we need to do is stop this. We need to stop you living inside this artificial box. So you'd created a box for yourself of, a, of your version of a nice guy, and they were showing you how to get out of that box. Is that correct? Exactly right. Yep. You can't be a good spy and be a nice guy. You're going you know, to say something stupid and get yourself killed. Um, and just like you can't be a nice guy and be really good with women, you can be nice. I, I, let, me, let me rephrase this, guys. For all of you that misunderstand this question every time I say it or statement, you can be nice by choice, but you can't be nice by default. And we used to, yeah, we used to say you can't be a pleaser. You can't be a people pleaser and also be an operator. You can't do both. Yeah, because when you have to say something that maybe causes a little tension, that, that causes a little discord, you won't do it. You'll try right. to get rid of and that'll get you in trouble. And in the operating world, you have to be in control of the conversation. So we we call it we call it uh, building rapport and then cashing in rapport. It's a term that we use in turn in the world of social capital. It was cashing in rapport. Oh, cashing in is because you built it. Now you can now you can get return on it. Exactly. And, of, and I got a couple questions for you. I'm getting really excited about this conversation. <laughs> um, part of building rapport is also being good at knowing when to break rapport, right? It's knowing when to cash in. That's exactly right. Because there's, you have to test a person's, like a, a person's connection to you, their attachment and loyalty to you. And the only way you can test that is by cashing in that rapport, asking for something in return, or like you said, breaking the pattern of constant rapport building and seeing how they respond. Because someone who's invested in you is going to respond with returned investment. But if all you're ever doing, if you're always pouring in, if you're always the one putting in, you never give it, them a chance to put in in return. So you don't really know where you stand in that relationship. And they lose respect for you because, you, you, because you're afraid to break that rapport and they sense they've got you wrapped. <clears throat> but they don't have to invest. They feel like they don't have to invest. And then what would you do? What would you do if someone would paid you for no work? You wouldn't do any work. You would just let them keep paying you and you would put your efforts somewhere else. And that's why so many nice guys end up watching their girl pursue some other douchebag. Or they send, spend 
day, night after night buying fancy dinners and treating her to gifts and getting nothing in return. And she's not even dating him and she's out having sex with some other guy yeah. because it's pretty damn nice to set a boundary. Yeah. That's, yeah. And, and she may not even know in, in all honesty, she may not even know that you are pursuing her as a partner. She may think that you're just, this is what, what brings you joy, you know, gifting your friends or she may think that she's just another person who's the recipient of your nice charitable giving. Right. It's uh, she doesn't understand that there's a purpose or, or uh, a, an end goal an intention. Yes, that's hundred percent true. So, uh, so we, we talk about the same thing with different languaging. What are some of the techniques or systems that the CIA would use to help break you or out of that box to stop you from being this nice guy, people pleaser to get you so you can be really honest and real, or in this case, step in attention where you need to, to get a response, turn that respect. Yeah. So one of the first things that they do is they, they obviously they profile our personalities and then they, and they, they tell us what that means. So you can go to any bookstore, any uh, grocery store checkout line, and somebody will, there'll be an article in some Maxim or some People magazine about your personality. But when you specifically tap into a Myers-Briggs type indicator, an MBTI personality test, and you get what is a four letter code coming out of the back of that, each of those four, each of those four letters in that code has a spe answers a specific question about how you engage the world around you, whether it's how you engage information, how you engage, how you gain energy, uh, how you make a decision, or uh, how you how you solve a problem. So it's that problem solving piece specifically that basically falls into two courts. You're either a judger or a perceiver. So anytime you face any kind of dilemma, any kind of um, challenge, which is essentially what all of dating is, you're facing a challenge, you will naturally kind of lean to one side or the other. The, in, the perceivers of the world are people who will try something new. They, they don't really believe in a process. They don't really believe in a system. They just go out there and they swing. And if the swing hits, they'll swing the same way again, where they may make a small change. The J on the opposite side, the judger, that's somebody who wants a manual. They want a book. They want a list. They believe that it's been done a hundred times the same way. And I want to learn how to do it that exact right way. So what ends up happening is for us in the field, CIA is looking for people who are, who act like J's, but who in fact are P's because we have, we have blended ourselves into the world because we have learned that there's a game that we have to play to succeed. But when you get into field operations, the way that the game works is that you have to be in control of, of the, of the game board. So the first thing they need us to do is know that we can succeed within the realms of the game. And then they teach us how to play the game so that we can master it over others. And in personality terms, it's all about being either a perceiver or a judger. And the goal is to be more on the perceiver side. So that's really what they do is they, they put us in touch with that side of ourselves. If you are on the judger side, that's fine, but maybe you're just not made for field operations specifically. Interesting. Um, I had a teacher once that said, uh, Carl, uh, and he was one of, he had a huge impact on my life. And he said, you got to learn to, whenever you enter into a new company, a new system, a new operation, if you want to rise to the top, the first thing you got to do is play by the rules and you got to show them you can play by the rules hundred percent and then earn the right to set the rules. And then you got to be, then you play outside the box and you set the rules, you change everything. But if you come in there trying to change everything right away, you're going to, you're going to cause uh, discord that's not good. You're going to cause a problems and everybody's going to start to judge you back, not like you. And then you're going to create all kinds of problems. And he said, that's how I would go into companies. And he goes, I would be the youngest guy in the company. And suddenly I'm in charge of everybody and everybody, yeah. everybody be mad at me, but I played by the rules and then they, and they promoted me past everybody else because then I showed I could also change the rules and make them work better after I earned that. Right. Is that what you're talking about? That's exactly right. Yeah. If you, if you think about the workplace, it's a great example. A lot of the teaching I teach is to show people how to use this in the workplace. When you come in and all you do is you, you play by, you play your own game, your own way, and you don't care about the rules. You don't care about the local culture. You don't care about the role you stepped in on. People look at you and they call you a rogue. They call you a loose cannon. They call you terms that degrade and, and denigrate you and, and build you up to get kicked out. But once you play by the rules for long enough, and then you start pushing the boundaries. Then they call you revolutionary. Then they call you transformational, right? The same person doing the same actions is called by different words, has a whole different reputation 
when they understand this concept of 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 judgment and perception, which is why one of the first, first things I teach people is about perception and perspective, because perception is you living in your own head. Perception is that rogue young person who rolls into a job and doesn't care about anything that's already there, just tries to do it their own way. They're living in their own world of perception. They're the center of their story. They're the star of their movie. They don't even realize there's a whole other cast out there. I see but that then, in youth a lot today. You see that in youth? I feel like you also see that in the generation, uh, the generation gap when you look back at like Gen Xers. Gen Xers, for some reason, feel like they've paid their dues and now they're free to be themselves and, and they don't realize there's still a game. There's still a game to play because those the people in between, like you were saying, the, guy, the young folks who come in, master the workplace and then run it, they don't really care that you've been at the company for 25 years. You either play by the rules or you don't. Yeah, I've had young, uh, young coaches come in and then they suddenly want to change the way we do everything at Fearless because they, they're day one, day two. They're like, let's do this instead. Let's do that instead. And I'm just like, you don't even know why we're doing what we're doing yet. And yet you want to change everything. <laughs> it's almost annoying. And then pretty soon they get really resentful when you put the brakes on them, which then makes you at a certain point want to get them out because they're not listening. And uh, then they wonder why and they judge everybody. They wonder why, you know why they ended up that way, you know, why you want to get rid of them. They don't, they, they take it all personal and they don't realize they're not settling in and earning the respect first. And so how would this relate back to our original topic? If you, you're talking about uh, dating, how would this relate back in your mind? If you were, if you're out as a spy and you want to meet a beautiful, you got to meet a beautiful woman and maybe you got to make her like you and connect with her and to get some information, something like that, or, or, or drop in a little deeper. How would this relate so the first thing you got to remember that just like a job or just like a work, a culture at work, every human being that you meet has a culture. There's a there's a box that they live in. There's a world that's safe and, and something that they're that they're able to digest very quickly and very rapidly. So if you want to make a connection quickly, you have to understand that your little box where you're comfortable doesn't matter. What matters is where they're comfortable. You have to meet them on their terms. So the best thing you can do is roll in and be uh, and be uh, observation based, be uh, inquisitive, be curious, be helpful, be all the things that are the opposite of threatening and forceful so that you can learn first. It's called assessment. We call it gaining assessment data in the field. As you gain assessment, you get the data you need to know how to respond. It's not that different from the new coaches you were talking about. These new coaches roll in. They want to do things their way. They want to make all these changes. They're living in their little box. They're not even thinking about the fearless box before they show up. How often do men go up to a girl and all, in, all that's in that man's mind is his world, what he's afraid of, what he sucks at. He doesn't like that he's short. He doesn't like that he's got a, a, a belly that's bigger than his pecs. Whatever it might be, he's living in his world. He has no, for all we know, that girl likes guys that are a little bit short and a little bit chunky, but he's not even thinking about that. He's too busy focused in his box. When you walk up to someone and you've got to focus on their box, where are their boundaries? What are they interested in? And you can get that from something as simple as just looking at what they're wearing, observing their jewelry. What are they drinking? If you give yourself 20, 25 minutes to observe somebody at a distance before you approach them, you'll learn an incredible amount of information from how much they laugh, how much they smile, how much they touch their hair. Are they fidgeting with shoes that are too big for their feet? You'll learn so much about watching somebody before you talk to them through the lens of observing them and observing the box that is their worldview. Well, this is this is a very interesting topic because I will we will give this advice to some of the nice guys, especially the analytical nice guys that are in their heads. And then what they'll do uh, to observe and to go up and be curious. But what they'll do is they'll go up and I don't know if you run into this problem uh, to be curious. And because they're so analytical, they don't feel curious. They think curious. And so they start asking all these analytical questions from their head. They're saying, well, I'm being curious, but it feels like an interview to the girl. <laughs> um, and I'm like, no, you got to actually be curious. You got to know what it's like to feel curiosity in your body and be truly curious for other human beings. So they teach that. Do you have to go through that ability? Yeah, yeah there's a, yeah, there's a certain, um, every, at the end of the day, what every spy wants is information. We're always looking for secrets. And we know that the person we're talking to either has access to secrets or doesn't have access to secrets. 
But the secrets is not the first thing you're going to get. The first thing you're going to get is the sticky, the sticky, messy, all the things that make someone human. So we have to learn to appreciate empathy. We have to learn to appreciate that human connection first. So when we approach a target, even if we know that that target's some senior ranking general in charge of a nuclear facility, we don't ever approach them thinking about how we're curious about their information. We're thinking about how we're curious about their vulnerabilities, their strengths, their weaknesses, their goals, their ambitions, you know, their passions, their interests, they are, they are just as sticky as all of us. The human being that you're, that you're approaching is just as sticky as any other human being, just as messy. They have their own judgments about themselves and the world around them. So the best way to approach that person is, is with a curiosity of the person, not a curiosity of the, the end goal. So for us, that end goal, of course, is is information. For some people, the end goal is just a kiss. For some people, the end goal is getting laid. For some people, the end goal is a long-term relationship with multiple kids. You, If you start there, you're curious about the wrong thing. So it sounds like to me, and this is something that is important to me, is you, you have to have the end goal in mind. You have to know what it is, but then you release it. You can't be attached to it. Um, you can choose it. This is what my end goal is now. What's the moment one? The moment once I need to get to know this person and just right. develop actual relationship with them and i'll get back to the angle later um is, is that right am i getting that right yeah you're, you're absolutely right there was an awesome comparison that one of my instructors gave me once and he said that if you're sitting in california and you look at a map you can see on the map the city that you're in in california and you can see on the map where you're trying to go in new york and you can see it you can see exactly where you have to go every road every turn everything but then you get in the car and you start driving and the sun goes down and the only thing you can see is the area in front of you where the headlights touch the road. The goal is still there, but you're never going to get there if you don't pay attention to what the headlights are showing you on the road in front of you right away. And that just was such a powerful idea for me where it's like my job, my operation is the light on the road from the headlights. That's it. I'm not going to get 10 feet further unless I cover these 10 feet first. The sun will come up. The sun will go down. New York isn't going anywhere. I'll get to my end goal, but I got to drive this road 15 feet at a time, just as far as the headlights show me. And I think your analogy, I use, I use a map analogy a lot too, how going from California to New York, I use it in a slightly different way, but I, I love your analogy. I, I talk about the uh, navigation system, how you plug in the address. The navigation system never forgets the address, but now what does it focus on? It focuses on the next turn. Yeah. The address, it, and, and, and if it has to reroute you, a little out of the way because of some damaged road, it'll do that or weather pattern or traffic. It'll do that. But it's always saying eventually we'll get here. Don't worry about it. Yeah, now. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> now enjoy it. Be, be, be present as to where you're at. Um, so if we relate this back to men and dating, if we relate this back to, let's just use the, the bar, for example, because it's one of the, uh, even though we haven't been to bars as much lately because of COVID guys will go out to a bar and they walk in the room and I see this with dating companies, these, these pickup companies that I, I, I'm, I, I don't like the term pickup anymore because of, of the bad stigma. But they go into the bar and their goal is to, I want you to talk to as many women as you can today and I want you to hit on, and they're just so not in the now. And they're pushing, 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 doing almost the opposite of that. They're like, hi, hey, what's up? How you doing? And there's this fake persona that's yeah. coming here it's push, 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 and they don't know how to relax and just be in the moment with the human being and enjoy that human being. Um, and what happens, you can literally feel when they come in, 10 of them will come into a room or eight of them, and the anxiety of the whole bar does this. You can mm. feel it rise. And then when they leave, you can feel it drop back down. And I've been in a bar once where two, cr two different crews from two different companies came in at the same time, and I was like, dear God, look at all the women and their defenses go up. Mm see the defenses how they start to close off as a spy you go into these high t pressure situations and you're you know it's really high pressure it's much higher pressure than what these guys are going through how do you keep from ending up in that nervous anxious place how do you stay so relaxed and calm in your body so this i mean it's an awesome question there are we're taught that there are three lives that everybody has have you heard this before have i if i'm boring you tell me no, no. no there's, there's three lives. Let me get on screen. There's three lives that everybody has. Everybody has a public life. Everybody has a private life. And then everybody has a secret life. 
the public life is the life that you want everybody else to see. It's the life you show. It's the persona you put on. It's the, it's the fake. It's the, it's the, the world that is what you want people to believe you are, but you really aren't. And then there's the private life. The private life is the life that your closest friends, your closest peers, your closest family knows. It's the real you to a certain extent, the intimate version of you. And then there's the secret life. And the secret life is the life that only a few people will ever get to see. It's where you hide your biggest shames. It's where you hide your biggest embarrassments and humiliations. The things that you're most, you're most sad and discouraged about yourself. That's where the secret life lives. We are taught that every person we approach is living and demonstrating their public life. It's not real. It's just what they want to show. Tons of energy, tons of effort, tons of money, tons of time goes into this public life. And when a public life person runs into another public life person, it's just, it's two flashes in the same pan, right? There's no connection. It's just, it's blinking and then they separate. The way you get past that is you lead with your private self. You lead from a place of genuine authenticity and vulnerability, and you appear like an authentic, genuine person. And now you've got this flashing public life and this very calm life, and that the calming private life actually encourages the other person to want to connect private life to private life. For us, that's important because once you connect private life to private life, you're on someone's inner circle. And from that inner circle, you move them into a secret relationship. In relationships, in actual meaningful, deep relationships, you connect private life to private life so that you can then connect secret life to secret life. And you don't have to keep secrets from one person, the one person you love and trust the most. Yeah, that's powerful. Because um, we always talk about the power. Of, the, the way we phrase it is you got vulnerability and tension. And your vo most vulnerable self is is the one that every that really connects. But most men are scared to show their most vulnerable self. They're scared to open up. And I'm not talking about this needy victim -y self. This, the part of you that has an emotion that feels a little nervous and raw and open hearted. And that's what women get drawn to. But they put on, they think they're going to be vulnerable from their head. It just doesn't work. Yeah. Um, and so if you can learn to lead with that person, uh, people feel more connected to you. They, they feel more Go you demonstrate it. your leadership right away, right? If you are a calming force in a world of chaos, right? Remember, you're thinking about the other person. They live in a chaotic world. If she's single and she's got friends, she's watching other friends connect. She's watching other friends fall in love. She's got pressure from mom and dad. She's trying to balance what it's like to be beautiful and professional and successful and you know, not show her, her weakness and her own vulnerability as a female. When you approach that person vulnerable, all that does is it makes them feel calm and confident in you as the driver and you as the leader, and it makes them want to be vulnerable with you. Yes. Yeah. The one thing I always say is that true confidence isn't putting up a big wall and walking up. Like guys will say all the time, uh, just go talk to her, be confident. So I'll be put up a big wall and I'll be like, okay, I'm confident. Uh, sales, sales is the same way. Getting on the stage is the same way when you're public speaking. Put up a big wall. Hi, I'm Brian. How are you? What's your name? Where are you from? That's that's bullshit confidence and women know that that's coming from pride that's coming from ego we drop that and we actually get to the point where we can own our big deepest fears and our our sadness our loneliness our love our passion our curiosity and we put it right out there for everybody to see when we're on stage we put it right out there for everybody to see on video we put it right out there for the women to see when we walk up and then we own it and we don't become a victim or blame it we become magnetic and magnetic. that magnetic yeah excellent word yeah, and that's that's what the guys need to realize on this call is you're, we're saying the same thing with different words. It's super magnetic because think about what's more confident, a guy with a wall saying, hey, what's up? Or a guy saying, yeah, you terrify me and I don't give a fuck. I'm going to show up anyways. Yeah. You know, I'm going to show up. Like, I'm shaking and I don't care. I'm right here. I ain't going anywhere. How are you? That's That's a different, that's a whole different mentality. And... But it seems like you would have to really, as, as an agent in, 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 a, in the CIA or somebody that's being qualified as an agent for the CIA, you, you have to be, you have, they have to really look for somebody that's, do they, I'm guessing they look for somebody that's capable of that to some degree ahead of time and then they cultivate the rest. Yeah, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's surprising to most people. So this, what CIA does is CIA knows that the skills they teach can be taught to anybody. Anyone can learn the skill. 
that, I mean, one of the most powerful things to me was when I was taught that there really isn't anything special about me as an individual that got me into CIA. What got me into CIA was the fact that CIA needed the background that I brought to the table. They needed somebody ambiguously brown with a giant forehead, right? They needed somebody who didn't look American. I happened to speak Chinese at the right time. I happened to be experienced in nuclear engineering at the right time and nuclear missiles and nuclear warheads. And that was what they needed at the time. So CIA, I mean, you, the world's intelligence services from, from Russia to the US to Mexico and India, all these intelligence services know that they can train pretty much anybody to do the skills that they need in about six months. What they can't train is the years of experience beforehand that make you an expert in engineering or fluid dynamics or whatever else. So it's really not that the person itself was born to be a spy. It's that the spy was built out of the person that they needed. And that's how it works. So just like CIA has total confidence, they can teach anybody the skills that you and I are talking about, which tells me anybody can learn the skills that you and I are talking about. I'm, I'm building a business taking people into live experiences where they're learning these skills. They're learning dead drops in a matter of hours. They're learning how to bump a stranger and gain critical intelligence in a matter of hours. They're learning escape and evasion. They're learning tactical driving and tactical shooting. They're turning into a badass overnight because the skills are trainable. Everything you're teaching is absolutely trainable. Yeah, yeah. And that's the, it took a long time because um, I was so in my head too. Part of the problem I had is I went to my original teacher who taught something called feeling, which is a lot of what we're talking about, being in feeling, being able to relate to your emotions without being subject to your emotions, being able to feel another person's emotions without being controlled by those emotions, being able, which is a lot of, I think, when we go back to the original concept of this call. Um, and uh, he was a very powerful individual. He would speak on the radio. Everybody wanted to buy from him. He would go give a talk and because he was just so present all the time. Um, and that's what Fearless was built on this principle. For me, it took me a long time to get out of my head because I was so, he used to say, you're so in your head, Brian, you're above your head. <laughs> and then uh, we have, I have a picture on a video. I think it was last week's video or something. You guys all saw it uh, you got in the chat of me like 20 years ago. And it just, people are like, dear God, that doesn't look like you anymore. You look like a different human being. And it's from the, the depth of the embodiment. So I want to acknowledge you because I'm, I'm very curious to come see your workshops and see your process for getting somebody... I mean, I, I, getting somebody to get to that point where they can really be present with somebody else without their nervous system freaking out, without their their body pulling them out, without them shooting their head as a defense mechanism, this type of stuff. And uh, I get that's what I'm most curious about. That's why I keep asking these questions. Um, so let's dive a little deeper into the the subject of the call that you really wanted to talk about, which was uh, perception versus um, uh, how did you say? Yeah, perception versus perspective. Exactly right. Which I see it as in, in non-duality is turning on the observer and learning to use the observer. So let's talk about it from your perspective. Okay. Yeah. So you just, I mean, that was the perfect segue. Let's talk about it from your perspective. When you talk, when, when you just started that sentence just a second ago, Brian, you said, when I hear you say those words, it makes me think of the observer and was it non-duality? Is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so collapsing duality allows you to go free of outcome. Uh, the place where your brain went, the place where your brain went was your perception. Yeah. It was what's important to you, what you value, what you care about, what you're interested in. It, like That is the natural human response. That is how every human being is wired. It goes back to self-preservation, fight or flight, us living as cavemen, having to protect our own life first. Right? Perception is totally natural. It's what's wired into all of us. It's why when someone says something that's interesting to you, you respond by talking about all the interesting things you know about or you learned about with regard to that subject. It's what kills the first contact with a female because she's going to say something and then you're going to start rattling off about yourself. And the last thing anybody wants to hear about is you. The one subject no one ever gets tired of hearing someone else talk about is themselves, right? If you talk about me, I'm going to let you talk all day long, Brian. I'm going to love everything you have to say. But if you sit there and talk about yourself, in about three and a half minutes, I'm going to be wondering if someone texted me, if there's something else I need to be doing, what's on my grocery list, right? So perspective, perspective is what happens when you intentionally think about what the other person's experience is. 
the reason that it's so valuable to operators is because we already know 99.9% .9 of people out there are untrained in what we're talking about right now. The vast majority of people are, are operating according to their animalistic wiring. They're thinking through their own two eyes, their own perspective. That's all that matters to their own perception. That's all that matters to them. When you, when you enter a situation thinking about perspective, what does my target think? What do the two and what are the two people at the two exit doors think? What do the five people sitting in the back row think is happening in this conversation? You gain this informational edge, this dominant position over everything else in the room because you are the only person considering multiple data points from all pers all points of view to have an over an overarching perspective of the situation. I um, I'm going to keep talking if you just give me another second. Yeah, go for it. Keep going. I had, I taught, uh, I just came off of a weekend teaching people escape and evasion in an urban setting. And it was badass, right? One of the first things, one of the things that we did is we taught them uh, physical defense, something called defensive tactics, how to basically connect mind to body and use that to, to defend yourself in an anti kidnapping situation or a kidnapping situation. And one of the most powerful elements that, that always comes up when I teach people this is that. Um, if you use Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, if you're one of those people who learned Krav Maga or, or Brazilian Jiu Jitsu to defend yourself, if you actually get into a scuffle on the street and some attacker tries to attack you and then you beat the shit out of that attacker, right? You're throat punching, you're face punching, you take them to the ground, you've got them in arm bar and then a police officer shows up. Who does the police officer think is the threat? You, because you're the one kicking the other guy's ass, Right? You have completely lost perspective because in your perception, you're thinking I'm under attack. Meanwhile, everybody else around you is looking, thinking the poor bastard that you're beating up is the innocent victim. And that's how cops end up pointing guns at the wrong people. Right. That element that the, the importance of that point of view is immensely powerful when it comes to running any kind of operation or having any kind of end goal where you want a specific outcome because you need to control the entire situation. You can control the entire environment if you keep in mind the perspective of others because everyone else is just thinking about their own point of view, their own perception, their own uh, interests and values. So tell me if I got this right. Um, you're talking about basically, well, in natural law, I call it the law of relativity or the relative nature, getting a big relative perspective. And I did say the observer, um, the context, versus content. Are these, are these analogies correct? Yeah, exactly right. Okay. Awesome. And, uh, and so you spend a lot of time coming in when you come into any situation, you start with context before you start with content is what you're saying. Yeah. You start with what's, yep. What is, if you're talking about context, meaning what am I walking into? Where is this person's heart and mind and goals right now? And where do I fit into that long term? That's that's exactly right. Okay, let me ask you a question. When do you ever share, and maybe you do this intentionally or maybe you do it in, unintentionally, but you're saying, you know, you really want to get them talking. But sometimes to get somebody talking, to get them sharing, it requires a bit of you sharing. Um, because you have to share something vulnerable, which then makes them feel safe to open up to you. Do you ever do you ever make this as part of the whole picture? Yeah. Absolutely. So we, we actually have a, a funny rule of thumb. So a lot of times what happens with folks who come to everyday spy training is they'll come in and they'll be introverted when they approach, when they come in. Um, and they'll have struggled with either social environments or maybe work, work, uh, conflict, relationship, conflict, uh, peer conflict, whatever it might be. And I teach them this concept about perspective and perception. I teach them how important it is to know how to use a question to your own operational advantage. And then they, they say the same thing that you were saying earlier, right? Like, how do I know when I'm asking a question versus when I'm giving an interrogation? Mm -hmm. And the trick that we were always taught, because if analysis paralysis sets in, you got to have a way of breaking it. The trick that we were taught was two questions and one confirmation, two questions and one acknowledgement, basically, right? So, you know, Brian, I'll ask you two questions about you. And then whatever you say in response to the second question, I will then make a connection where I acknowledge what you said and make it relevant to me. So when I talk about myself, I'm talking about myself through something that you've told me about you. So every time I talk about me, I'm building a connection because I'm basing my commentary off of you. You tell me that you like uh, old movies. I'll tell you, I like old movies that are musicals, 
Maybe you don't like musicals. doesn't really matter. You like old movies, and now you're looking at me, and you think Andy likes old movies too. He's a cool guy, right? Yeah. If I were to just roll in and be like, hey, I really love 1950s era musicals, then there's no context for you. Your guy, that, that's kind of weird, buddy. Like, where have you been for the last 50 years, right? So it's a completely different way of leveraging questions or leveraging that connection to your own advantage. Yeah, this is very interesting. The um, And I'll relate it back to something. Uh, the first time I learned the art of rapport, which was a workshop I took many years ago, they would call it like almost like a hot potato. You're sharing a little, then asking a question, sharing a little. But I like what you just did there because what you did there was a little different. Um, you said, ask two questions and then share a little. And it keeps the focus a little on the other person. And that's the intent, I'm guessing. That's exactly right, man. Because remember, the thing that no one ever gets tired of hearing you talk about is them. So keep asking them questions. Never let it get to that interview state. It, you'll, it's amazing. You'll spend hours doing two and one, two and one, two and one. And instead of the person ever stopping to say, oh, I'm talking too much about myself. Let's ask about you. It'll never happen. They'll just, they'll mm -hmm. just stay in this happy world, right? In like you were saying, a flow state. They'll just stay very comfortably and every time they talk, they're investing more and more into you and more and more into the relationship that you're building. It works like a dream with business clients. It works like a dream during interviews with, when you're looking at hiring somebody or firing somebody. It's amazing how much you can disarm somebody just by keeping a little bit, just keeping 66% of the attention on them, 33% of the attention on you. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah, uh, I find... <laughs> I find that learning and it, well, actually, I want to jump one more question because you're, you're really nailing a really important point, which is the more you get somebody else to share, the more they feel like they're sharing because they want to or because there's a sense of um, I don't know that sense of rapport. Right. I feel like I've known you forever. You probably hear that a lot. It feels good, too. Right. When you hear that. Very good. Yeah. And what about the art of listening? Now, this is a, a very important thing that I love to talk about. I want to ask you about it. because It sounds like you, you've got a skill set for it. The art of listening is not just listening to their words, is it? There's a, there's a deeper art to it. Can, can you talk about that from your perspective? Yeah. So when, when I look at listening, I look at listening as kind of a, a, a two-skill two mastery that's partly being able to read between the lines. Like what are the, what are the concepts? What are the, what are the statements that they're saying outside of the words that they're using? But then you also have to have the ability to remember the statements that you're hearing between the lines. So it's a little bit of a little bit of a foreign language where you have to interpret instead of simply hear, interpret the feelings, interpret the the statements themselves and then also recall them because the next time you have a next time you sit with this person, the next time you text message this person, the next time you have a chance to talk to this person, you don't want to start from zero. You want to start from the end of the last statement of the previous conversation so that they're right back in there with you. You can cash in on all that social capital in just a moment. So it really is when someone says, you know, I'm having a, today's been a good day or today, you know, I'm a little bit tired or whatever. What they're saying is not just that they're tired. They're saying something has drained their energy. What is that draining thing? You might assume well, they must've had a big day at work, but maybe their big day at work energized them. Maybe the draining thing is actually with family. So it's better to just to listen and understand like I've had a I've had a rough day. Well, I've had a rough day could mean a lot of different things. Don't assume anything. Listen and hear there's there's information to be gathered and the person is already feeling comfortable enough to admit that they're not having a perfect day. They're they're already shedding some of that public life to let you into their private life. Yeah, and that's that's huge too. Um when I look at it, I want to ask if, if you can relate back to this at all or give a little more perspective on the, how you look at it. When I look at it, I'm always paying attention to, um, and I think you kind of just said this, so maybe I'm re being redundant, but I'm paying attention to what emotions and feelings are coming up in their body as they speak. So I might hear them say a sentence, but they might say one thing they gloss over, but I can feel the sadness come up in that one thing. I can feel anger come up in that one thing. And then they gloss over it as they start to feel, they feel a little emotion rising and then they jump topic. Mm. And I take note of that. And uh, sometimes I'll ask about that depending on the time and what's going on. Hey, you know, tell me about this and I'll move I'll, and, I'll, and I'll go back to that topic because I know there's something deeper there. Do you guys ever, are you trained to do that? Do you do any work with that? 
Yeah, we call it a shift change. Whenever you see them shift change like that, you see them go from second gear to fourth gear, right? Because they, they landed on a topic that they didn't want to talk about. So we do a lot. We have now that I'm now that I'm talking about it with you, I'm realizing how much vernacular we pull out of like traffic. There's red lights, green lights and yellow lights. When you're when you're having a conversation and somebody and you hit on a topic that turns somebody off, that's a red light. When you hit on a topic that makes somebody pause or shift change, that's a yellow light topic, right? Yellow light is the is the entry point to the private life. And then when someone just blurts out whatever's at the top of their mind, that's a green light topic. All day long, you can talk about the weather. All day long, you can talk about work. You know, all day long, you can talk about fitness and exercise and what you watched on Netflix. You're never going to get to the heart and soul of somebody doing that. But when you hit that yellow light, when you hit that shift change where they gloss over something, right? You know, it was a rough day. You know, I had my dog and my dog was, you know, whatever. I don't really want to talk about it. How, how are you? Boom. Shift change. Crystal clear yellow light doorway to the private life is right there. What we have to do is fight off the instinct to jump on the question. No, no. Tell me what happened to your dog. Tell me, tell me about that pain that you're feeling. I really want, I really want to be here for you. So tell me about it. It's like the best thing to do when you have a shift change is you reflect it back on yourself, right? And you talk about something painful or something challenging or something difficult that's happening in your private life because they're already primed to be vulnerable. You yeah. just have to give them the space to come out and be vulnerable. That's well, what yeah. they're looking for. And if you go there first and you show them, I'm, I'm comfortable going here, so I'm going to invite you into this space, and then, then typically they'll go there too. And uh, I find that to be very powerful. I find that our average student, though, doesn't do what you just said. Maybe as a spy, I can totally see it. I'm, I want to jump. <laughs> <laughs> our average student hears that shift change and, and then avoids that topic because it would mean going into something deeper and they're like, oh, I'll just oh. keep it fluffy, you know, and, and we'll stay up here because Let's I find keep talking about that. Netflix. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and so we have to almost coach them into that, but it can be like, you, like you, you were just talking about, it can be one of the most powerful moments of this other person's life. It can be life changing for them. I have a student where I heard him talk about a line in a painting and this is over 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And I called him out on the line because I could feel the depth of the, the emotion that when he referenced this line, but he, he did a shift change like you called it. And uh, went back, started talking about it. And he got, he said, he didn't even know. He was like, it's just a line. What are you talking about? We'll talk a little more about it. And he started talking more about it. And he could see these emotions come up and all these feelings come up. And then pretty soon he's talking about, oh my God, I miss being a painter. I, mm. I painted that line. And then next thing you know, he starts painting. And the next thing you know, 10, 15 years later, he's got a gallery in Miami now. And because of that conversation, right? And that that's the power of knowing, asking a question like that. Now I had the permission in that moment because we were in a workshop setting to go right for that question. But you're right. You can't sometimes go right for the question. And and you know it's and this is this is the dark side of me, right? So for anybody out there who's wondering, am I still a nice guy? This should be how you know I'm not a nice guy, right? That man, wherever he's sitting in his gallery, he gives you credit for his work. He gives you credit for his own discovery. Like that loyalty that should belong to him is actually with you. So if you were to be on, if you were to be representing a foreign government, if you were to be representing anything nefarious, you would have immense influence over that individual. That yeah. is, that's the key to the kingdom. That's what, that's what every foreign intelligence officer, every U S intelligence officer is trying to do. How do we get someone to open up at the right time in the right way that they basically give us credit for their own success. They're the ones taking all the risk. They're the ones that are going to get shot and hung by their own foreign government. But if we do it the right way, they think it's all worth it just to be with us. Just like your client thought it was totally worth it, right? He sits in a gallery thank, thanking God every day for meeting Brian. Yeah. And that's, a, I'm, I mean, I hate to say it, but that's absolutely true. If I call him, it's, he's on the phone instantly. He wants to learn more always. He's like, what, 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 what do you have that's new? What are you, what are you doing now? You know, and he's curious. <laughs> and uh, luckily I'm not that kind of guy. <laughs> I am still somewhat of a nice guy, so I don't, <laughs> I don't ever really be happy. So, um, so, uh, so really quick, we are about an hour in. I want to do a quick commercial really quick. Um, Andrew is going to be at the Integrated Man Summit, which is coming up in uh, November in Miami. You're already in Miami, right? You live in Miami or you live out in Florida somewhere, right? Close well, enough to Miami, yeah. I'll be yeah. there for sure. 
Yeah, so he'll be out speaking live at this event. He'll probably be speaking all uh, at least two days, probably three days uh, on these topics. So if you guys out there really love these topics and you want to go deeper with Andrew, you want to talk to him in person, you want to ask him questions in person, November 4th through the 6th in Miami, Florida is going to be the Integrated Man Summit. There's a link on the screen. There should be a link in the chat in a moment for you guys to uh, get tickets. You can go out there live. You can also do it online. There's gonna be an online version as well for everybody that can't travel. If you're in, uh, I saw some of you are from uh, Europe. So if you're in, in Europe, definitely click on the link. You can still get tickets. And uh, I'm assuming that uh, Andrew's got a lot more stuff and a lot deeper stuff. I mean, than, than we can even re remotely touch on in an hour call. So, um, and if you really wanna get some of that deeper stuff, Definitely click on that link and get and get uh, and, and get over to the uh, the event that's coming up in Miami. Yeah. So Brian, I just the the thing I'm the most excited about bringing to Miami is talking about sex through espionage, which is a term that's kind of colloquial called sexpionage. But it's not just about you know who's having sex with who to get what secrets. It goes so much deeper into how spies use sex. To, to boost their own cognitive abilities, how spies see sex as like a rejuvenating process, how they see human connection as like a vehicle that can represent the pleasures and the joys of sex and all sorts of different things that relate sex specifically to espionage. Um, but it's so, like you said, it's so heady and it's such an intimate topic. It just doesn't lend itself well sometimes to a one hour podcast. It's so much better when it can when it's a live conversation that happens where people can ask real time feedback and we can take it to the margins during breaks and we can come back and recap stuff the next day. It's, it's that kind of topic, which is why it's so special to get to talk about it at a place like Tim's. Yeah. And then on um, typically on Saturday night, on Friday night, we'll have a VIP session where you, you'll be invited to come speak. And that's off camera for anybody that wants to be part of the VIP. If you buy the VIP, that's off camera. You can ask all those questions that maybe he's not willing to talk about on camera. <laughs> so, uh, Thank you so, for being the one to say that. Yeah. So I just wanted to throw that out. With sex espionage, there might be a few of those topics. <laughs> um, is any of that, by the way, is any of that sex espionage stuff, is that any of that related or pulled from any of the old uh, man talk chia, Taoism, Tantra, any of that? A lot of it actually does go back to uh, the tantric practices that the Indians understood like way back in the day, like some of the stuff that's tied into Buddhist and, and the different energy flows. And uh, there's some really cool stuff that's there made practical, right? Like yeah. it's really hard to teach some people the spiritual side of things, but you can break a lot of spirituality down into practical systems that anyone can understand. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's heavily rooted in human nature and a lot of the most basic human nature is wrapped up in spirituality before it was ever made into a system. Yeah. I find sex can heal and f sex can be destructive depending on how it's used. Mm -hmm. um, and if it's done properly and you're with a woman, she can feel like she went through a healing growing experience. You can too, you know, and that's what I love about yeah. this stuff. Sex, espionage, um, Tantra, Taoism done properly. <laughs> well, because practically speaking, again, I'm a very practical person. If a woman feels like having sex with you is a healing process, that's there's very little you can do to, to have to motivate her to have to do it again, right? Like no, she's no. gonna go right back to the doctor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. She's she's uh yeah, we're right back to the doctor, you being the doctor. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's perfect. Um so what we want to do now is uh, we're a little about an hour in, so we should be diving into some questions. I'm sure that we've got a big crowd. You got a, a good sized crowd. So I'm sure they've got a lot of questions. I've, I've been seeing them pop up in the chat. Let's get a, uh, Andrew's got control. The other Andrew, Andrew Shantz has got control of the questions. Andrew, do you want to uh, pop on here and, um, and pop us up some questions? Yeah, that's oh. our first one right there. Awesome, buddy. Thank you. Um, so are you ready for questions? I'm sorry. Yeah, let's do it. Oh yeah, absolutely. I love the questions are what make it all worthwhile, man. Before I ask this first question, is there anything you wanted to say, get out before we dive into more questions, but it, it was on the, it was like, I haven't said yet, but Brian hasn't asked it yet. I need to say it. Is there anything that needs to be said or anything? No, I mean, the, the energy here is awesome. The, the, the concepts are so applicable. It's right. It's right in everything I care about. So bring it on, man. I'm sure these questions are just going to relate more to the, the power and the energy we're talking about. Awesome. Let's do it. Um, the first one's from Tucker. Uh, how do you allow the person to open up when they are glossing over when they're glossing over the yellow light? That's a great question. So there's two techniques here, right? The first is the one that we already talked about, right, Brian, where you see the yellow light, you see the shift change. 
So you give them the space because they're still present. They're present in that yellow light. They haven't left it yet. They, they've glossed over, but they're not talking about something new yet, right? They just ended the statement with, you know, I don't really want to talk about it, but they're still thinking about it. So the first technique is the one we talked about where you open up the door to vulnerability by saying something in line, saying something that, that is inviting to them to talk about your pain, something that builds a bridge. The second really powerful technique is something that we call silence, intentional silence. It's, uh, it's an elicitation technique that you use to get people to talk more. If you just give someone a, three beats is the, is the magic number, three beats, right? Inside your head, you think beat, beat, beat. If they're not talking after those three beats, you go to the first technique. But a lot of times what will happen is within those first three beats, they will say something. They will say something that takes the conversation further down a road that you want to go down. Either they'll change a the subject and be under something safe or they'll continue on the same road, right? Like the lady who might talk about her dog saying, might say something bad happened to her dog. She might go with a few steps after two and a half beats. She might say, I really love that dog. I've had her for seven years. Beat, beat, beat. She was a gift from my mom and dad and, and I'm not really sure how to deal with it, right? Those three beats are a lot of times all it takes. It can feel like an eternity to you, but it happens in an instant to them. This is really cool because um, well, I love teaching guys to use silence. I mean, it's a sales technique, right? Use silence, say less. Uh, pick up, old pickup guys used to say years ago, I can almost tell who's going to get the girl if two guys are competing for the girl because the guy who's speaking the most is going to blow it. Uh, <laughs> almost every time. The guy who can handle the silence is usually going to do better. And, uh, and so that, that technique right there, I love the idea of the beats though, because so many of the students are analytical and they get to, they get to, okay, let me just focus on this idea of a beat rather than waiting. And, um, and if I have to go more than three or four beats, then I can, maybe then I'll say something. Yeah. And yeah, so, exactly right. So that yellow light is such a cool place to be, but once you spot it, you've got two techniques to, to use it. Yeah. I've actually, uh, told guys <laughs> just as a practice, cause guys can't shut up. So I, I sit them out. <laughs> I'll sit them out and I'll say, okay, talk to a girl. And then uh, what I want you to do is once the conversation's connecting, I want you just to shut up and, and, and just stand there and just kind of enjoy the crowd, look around and just kind of keep the connection, feel her, be present and see how long you can go without saying a word and see if you can get her to open you back up. Oh, you know, nice. If you go into your head, she's probably going to get, it's going to get awkward. If you stay really low and relaxed and calm and open hearted, she's going to want to keep talking to you. And you're going to, and when you start to do this a bunch of times with different women, you're going to notice the difference. You're going to notice if you stay relaxed, they get pulled in, you go to your head, they walk away almost every time. Yeah. It's, it's a very interesting process. I don't know if you've ever done anything like that, but it's, it's fun to do. Well, what's, what's interesting to me is when you come across somebody who's naturally in their head. And then you see reflected back at you an untrained person. And then you just feel like, like the master at a keyboard, right? And you're like, I know how to do all this stuff. And this person's still trapped in their own head. And you're pulling them out of their head. You're bringing them into the reality. You're, bringing, you're grounding them. And it's just, it's such a powerful thing because that person just falls in love with you. Male, female, foreign general, nuclear scientist or not. Once you show somebody the joys of being present, they just, they're addicted to it and they just want to be around you more. 100%. It feels so much better. And um, I mean, it's, it's prison being in your head. It's a horrible place. Mm. So uh, what's our next question? Let's just dive in. So you got one, Andrew? Uh, Igor, how much do these techniques become habitual? And what are the usual pitfalls if they do? Oh, man. So Igor, this is a this is one of those private private life questions. <laughs> so uh, so the techniques become habitual. They become so habitual that they almost become second nature. One of the things that we often joke about at CIA is after a while, you don't have any real friends anymore. You're just friends with other CIA operatives because every conversation, every relationship becomes this game of transactional science where you're trying to get more than you give. Uh, and that's a very unhealthy world to live in. Um, it's a big part of why, uh, why retired CIA people are very difficult to listen to or talk to or be around. If you see them as, as pundits on CNN or MSNBC or, or Fox or anywhere, uh, you just listen to them talk and their expertise is impressive, but you never in a million years think it'd be fun to have a beer with that person because they have become so habitually uh, rooted 
in this manipulative transactional game that they've lost track of true genuine connection. And that's the biggest, that's the biggest pitfall when it becomes habitual. Uh, and when that's, that feeds into broken marriages, that feeds into failed relationships with children, that's uh, bad business decisions, all sorts of things flow out of that, which is why the trick, the key is to understand the technique and to keep a constant focus on the intention. Why are you doing this, right? If your end goal is to build a meaningful relationship, that's a powerful end goal to pursue. Our end goal was always to steal secrets from a foreign government and make a trader that keeps Americans safe. That's a very pragmatic objective. Yeah, that's, uh, that's powerful. Um, I have a quick question. Uh, let me see if I can have to re cause, uh, cause you were just saying something that triggered something in me. Do you find where'd that question? I feel like I'm blanking on the question a little bit. Cause you, I went like three different directions in my head and I started thinking <laughs> about this, but, um, do you find, I really want this question. It's going to come back. I'm going to give me another question. I'll find it because it's, it's an important question. Um, Oh, I have the question now. I had to rewrite. I reread his question and then it popped back into my mind because it popped in. Do you find that uh, that students have a tendency uh, to think about this stuff so much, like getting all these different systems and techniques that they end up in their head because of it? And how do you keep them from doing that? Yeah. Like one of the I used to deal with in the beginning is I would teach all these techniques to banter better, rapport better, to, you know, Play. And then, uh, then they were, they were thinking about it all the time. And I was like, you got to stop thinking about all this shit. You got to, you got to almost have it as muscle memory. So can you talk to that? Yeah. So I've got, I've got two kind of really relevant, uh, recent examples. So one happened just this weekend at our urban escape and evasion course. I had a student there who had no background in physical conflict at all. 115 pound, 20 year old boy, thin as rails, stood maybe five foot, five feet tall, right? A small, thin whelp of a guy, the kind of guy that nobody wants to like, that you're never afraid of this guy. And we're trying, I'm trying to teach him the physical defense techniques that can knock down an opponent three times his size, right? Something we call biomechanical advantage. I'm showing him how to use wrists. I'm showing him how to use elbows, knees. I'm showing him how to use a uh, weight shift, all these different things. And what I'm learning at each step of the way that I'm teaching this to him, he is becoming more and more in his own head what exact angle do I have to turn my right foot to? What exactly how far should my elbow be from my chest? Is my left shoulder too high? Like, am I supposed to be turning like this? I noticed that you were turning a little bit like this. And, and I had to pull him out of his head and say, look, man, you got to feel it. Like your body is the weapon. You've got to feel how it all comes together because how it comes together for your size and your stature is different than someone else. It's all about building the, the routine, building a habit, building a process that works for you using the core principles that I'm teaching you. And by the end of the training course, he was doing exactly that. He was breaking the grip of a, of a 250 pound Marine who was able to wrap his arms. You know, the, the poor guy's arms were smaller in radius than the Marines grips. And he was still able to break out of that guy's grip with the techniques that we were teaching by getting him out of his head, getting him into his body. But you're exactly right. The People like to go into their head when they start getting a system or a process. A lot of times you have to just reground them. You have to remind them that the system or the process is tailored to you. It's just like a good suit. It's not about the wool and the stitching. It's about being, it's about the best wool and the best stitching being built to your size and your dimensions. Yeah. Yeah. It's like dance steps. You got to learn the dance steps, but then at some point you got to throw out the dance steps and just work on the rhythm and the flow. Exactly. Um, um, and some people just have a hard time with that. And That's so. okay. Yeah. And dancing doesn't happen overnight, right? No, it, doesn't. it takes a lot of practice, but you know, I'll be damned if there isn't, everybody looks at a good dancer and is impressed. Yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. Okay. Next one we got from Jojo. Um, nope. Go back to that last question where we hadn't asked it yet. My bad. That's all right. Do you have it still? Teaching more red light yeah, and green light techniques. No uh, yellow yeah, light. Yeah, more red light and green light techniques. Yep. I thought or, it was uh, yellow, yellow and red light. Yep. Yeah. You're right. You're right, Brian. Yeah. So uh, the yellow light, red light concept is a super powerful concept. So the, the yellow light techniques that we talked about, silence, and then uh, 
opening a conversation on your side so that they, they walk through that yellow light. They turn that yellow light into a green light. Um, that's, those are two really powerful yellow light concepts. The most important thing with a red light is to understand that red means stop, but that doesn't mean stop forever. Right. Remember how I was saying that a conversation is actually two skills, the, the skill of reading between the lines, but then also the skill of recalling. So always recall a red light. Keep that in your head because the red light's not going to change from day to day. If you talk to a girl on Monday and you talk to her the following Monday, red light's still going to be the same red light. But by recalling that you hit that red light once, you don't make her have to repeat herself. And you know who notices that? She notices that. She notices that you're not asking the same boneheaded question over and over again that some other guy asks all the time. Guys always forget. You know, like This guy always forgot. That guy always forgot. Whatever. I was standing in line at a Starbucks. There's a Starbucks on the ground floor of CIA headquarters. Um, it's no, not, not everybody knows it, but it's there. And I was standing behind this absolutely beautiful brunette. I was uh, engaged to my wife, who is my, now my wife, but I was standing behind this gorgeous brunette who kept looking at me and I could get, I got the sense very clearly that there was something about my big nose or my big forehead. I don't know what, but something interested her. So I struck up a conversation and she, and she, she was, you know, flirtatious and she was showing all the right signs of a girl who's primed to be asked out, but I wasn't going to ask her out. And she mentioned her name. And I don't remember to this day what her name was because I wasn't invested in the conversation. Three days later, I'm at the same effing Starbucks at almost the same time. And the girl walks up behind me and she comes right up to me. And she says, oh, hey, Andy, how are you? It's good to see you again. You know, what have you been doing? I didn't know her name. She had told me her name. I remembered that she had told me her name, but I didn't bother remembering her name because I wasn't invested in the conversation. And when she realized that I didn't remember her name, she got pissed. Right. That's one of those red light areas where I hit a nerve and she expected a guy to remember her name. That's just as easy. If you hit a red light and, and somebody doesn't like having they know they remember that they told you that red light before you can lose them in an instant. And likewise, by remembering that red light, one day you're going to hit a yellow light that opens a door that lets you bring up that red light in a vulnerable place where they're willing to talk about it. And they're, it's going to be totally comfortable to them. And they're going to trust that vulnerability. And for whatever reason, their mind body connection is going to say, this guy gets me. This guy understands me. He gave me space. He gave me time. And now I'm going to be vulnerable because I can trust him. Yeah, that's, uh, that's super powerful. I also find, and I want to, I want to know if you guys talk about this. Whenever you do that, let's say for example, in this woman's name where you forgot her name, you forgot her name. She gets mad, but you handle it really well. Maybe not that day, could be another day. You start to talk again, but because you handled it so well, you grounded her out, you created space, you remembered the next time, you brought it, you were vulnerable about it. Suddenly it can actually create a tighter bond than if you never had the problem in the first place. Yeah, You're exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly right. And, and a lot of times the best way to, the best way to handle a red light gone wrong is by owning it, is by saying, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name. I'm horrible with names. It's not my strong suit, but there's no way I would ever forget like, uh, you know, your smile, your hair, whatever else it might be. Some, whatever line you choose to use or, or however you choose to kind of back out of it, own the fact that you screwed up. Own the fact that, that it's on you. It's your fault. It's not because of her. You were whatever. You're surprised that she remembered you. You thought you were just going to be a blip on her radar, right? So. Yeah, that's powerful. I found that to be super huge. Um, okay, let's, uh, what's the next one, Andrew? Other Andrew, I should call you. Uh, I'll call you Chance for the rest of the call. Um, <laughs> can you speak a little more about how do we keep authenticity when learning these techniques? We just kind of talked about that, but is there anything else you want to say about it? No, that's just the, it's all about the focus on the end goal. It's all about the intention, right? If your intention is to is to find girls and use them up and blow through them like you know like fifty dollar bills, there's that you're going to lose your authenticity. They're eventually they're going to see through it. Or if they don't start to see through it, you're going to start sucking at your game because you're losing the core principles. You're, you're getting away from the core principles of connection and authenticity, and you're getting into the core principles of abuse and manipulation. And that's not, health, that's not healthy. That's not going to get you to your end goal. But when you stay focused on the fact that you're, you're connecting to a human being with individual needs and you're looking for that puzzle piece, right? There's, I love that, that example or the, uh, the way that they talk about love or connection as a puzzle piece. Every puzzle is a unique shape, 
So you're not looking for the perfect puzzle piece. You're just looking for the puzzle piece that fits your puzzle piece perfectly. And that happens when you keep a focus on, on the intentionality of finding human connection with a meaningful partner who's going to take you somewhere beyond your dreams because they just unlock more power in you. Yeah. And I agree with that hundred percent. I, I used to say um, there are two types of guys out there. Uh, one guy's looking for numbers. He's looking to validate himself as many numbers, as many girls I can have sex with, you know, and then rack them up and brag about I've slept yeah. with on E200 or whatever it is. And there's another type of guy out there that's looking to just explore with and help women explore to have fun, to have a moment and see where the moment takes us. And it's not about the number. It's about, are we having a moment? Can we, yeah. and how do you want to explore? How do I want to, how can I make it more fun for you to explore? And yeah. then when he does that, that, that guy's a lot more inviting, I think on average. Um, okay. What's our next one? Let's see. We got a uh, Joe here. Uh, okay. No, we got one more. Uh, we already did that one. So let's do one more here. Uh, Omar, how do you know when you're out of your head and uh, connected to a person and what do you do to get out of your head if you're disconnected? Oh, that's a big question. So I think everybody has to know, there's a little bit of self uh, realization that has to go into knowing what it's like when you're in your head. There's some telltale signs, right? You, you know, you're in your head when you're not aware of your immediate surroundings, right? When your five senses disengage, when you're not hearing the sounds around you, when you're not seeing the brightness of the colors, when you're not smelling the smoke or smelling the perfume, when you're not, when your five senses fail you, you know you're really deep in your head. And that's a dangerous place to be in the field for us for lots of reasons. It's, a, it's not a helpful, a helpful place for you to be if you're trying to talk to a female and connect to her in the moment. But yeah, look for those five senses to fail you. And then you get out of there by focusing on those five senses. It's a simple, it's something that we often do uh, in the in wartime, in the battlefield scenario. When you're getting shot at, believe it or not, when you're getting shot at, you go to your head. You don't go to your gut. You go to your head and you start thinking, if I put my head out there, I'm going to get shot. If I put my head out there, I might get shot. If I, if I call in this radio thing, I might have five seconds before I make the right call. You know, how fast are they moving? How slow are they moving? Uh, based on the number of rounds I'm hearing, how many shooters are there, you're in your head. And a lot of times what you have to do is we, we force ourselves to stop and just touch the dirt, touch the ground, and just smell the air, feel the heat on your skin, listen to the noise. Like, And all of a sudden you'll start, everything just becomes clear. The moment becomes clear because you're focusing on those five senses. I would imagine that if you're sitting with a female, it's going to work the same as if you're under a firefight. Um, I've been fortunate that enough firefights make it so sitting in front of a female doesn't really put you in your head anymore. <laughs> yeah, I think some uh, there are some guys that go into their body more when they're under pressure uh, around women, and some guy, but most guys go into their head or go nervous. Some guys see a woman and they just drop in. It's like mm. animal instinct kicks on, and uh, it's pretty amazing. And I was wondering, I was going to ask you that in a firefight. Are there some guys, a very small percentage of guys that actually get more present in a firefight? Maybe it's 5%, 2%, 1%. Yeah, there are for sure. There are those guys and, and it's, it's a beautiful thing to see, but it's also a terrifying thing to see. Um, people who, who almost recklessly seem to not appreciate life because they're so focused on preserving life. Uh, it's just, it's a, it's a powerful thing to see. And a lot of times they, it's, it doesn't make them a better shooter. It doesn't make them faster on their feet. It doesn't make them a better leader, uh, but it's the kind of person that acts like an animal that's been cornered, right? Like that's, that's the scariest moment when, when you are in a position where you have to fight for your life. That's where you really realize, am I like a badger or am I like a llama? How am I going to respond? Like, how am I going to react in that moment? Am I going to cower in the corner until life is taken from me? Or am I going to fight tooth and nail, bite, scratch, and whatever else uh, until I either win or I go down fighting? And when you see those people in action, you never look at them the same after the firefight's over. Interesting. Are, are there, are there, let's go one step further. Is there any group that actually gets uh, super meditative? Like, uh, so focused, they're just in a zone, flow state? Oh. So I, well, I would, I'm talking about flow state being in those folks, right? They, um, they become so, so connected to their carnal nature, their carnal defense that they're just, they're just flowing. It's almost, I mean, I, I don't like using this comparison necessarily, but have you seen those movies? Like 
any of the Sherlock Holmes movies or some of those action movies where they they'll put a fight in that flow motion, like slow motion, where you just see the person. Every move they make is right. Everything they do is right. It's never that perfect, but it's a little bit like that. It's a little bit like how did that dude just cover 50 feet of ground and take out five bad guys? And we're all still back here, you know, dialing in air support. How did that happen? And who the hell's backing that guy up? Cause he's out there by himself right now. Right. So it, it does get to be that kind of flow um, um, in their minds. They might be meditative, but they're also the ones that go back to camp afterwards with no, with no aftershock. Right. They're the guys that go back and have a beer and then they're telling jokes about how they almost shit their pants. And they're, they're special. They're typically the special forces guys, right? I would imagine they become special forces. Yeah. A lot of those guys are guys that have tested themselves in some kind of tier one special operating uh, capacity, but every now and then you'll find there's, there's a great story. So I did a podcast series with a deep cover officer who spent a lot of time embedded with tier one operators. If you go, if you look up the everyday espionage podcast, that's my podcast. And if you look up episodes where they're titled ED Jackal everyday ED Jackal, Jackal was this awesome guy. And he tells this great story about a medic who was one of these flow state operators, but he was just a medic. And then one day there was a firefight and this medic just tapped into his flow state and he did things that nobody even thought was possible. And his nickname from that day forward became God because either he was a God or God had a special place for him in heaven to make it so that this guy just was untouchable. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what I was wondering about because um, did you ever see the movie Black Hawk Down? I have, and I read the book too. Yeah, loosely based on a true story, right? Yep. And, and you could see the difference between those uh, green, green uh, rangers and the Delta Force guys. And they really illustrated that, that extreme difference, how calm the Delta Force guys stayed under pressure, even in the face of sure, cer certain death. Yeah. I always remember the ending scene when that Delta Force guy got all those uh, rangers out of the... Um, uh, of the combat zone or whatever. I'm not sure the, the exact term, but got him out of that zone. And then he grabbed, was like a bagel, grabbed a coffee and just walked right back. <laughs> and calm Delta as guys, yeah. And Delta guys are like that. Delta guys are the most unassuming people in the world, man. They are, you would never know that you're standing next to one until you saw them in action. And then just like, and then afterwards you would doubt that you actually saw them do what you just thought you saw them do because they pick up a playboy and they kick up their shoes and they drink their coffee. Yeah, that's a certain mentality, I'm sure, and sure, uh, yeah. a rare breed. But that's what I was curious about. Cool. Uh, <laughs> I love yeah. cool moments, man. <laughs> I've seen guys like that uh, that are – they can't even teach. I've seen guys like that with women, and it's not as dangerous, but I've seen guys where they're not very assuming, but they get around women like in a bar or a really high-pressure situation, and suddenly this – charisma and this personality comes out that's so spontaneous and so on point and so in flow they're no longer thinking and they're just doing yeah they tend to be amazing they tend to be terrible teachers um <laughs> they, because they can't put words to what they're feeling yeah no it's all coming through them uh, there's a guy i used to know his name was uh they called him savage and his name was jason and he was my height my look he was about he he, he could have been my brother and i would go out with him and he, during the day, he was like, yeah, my life sucks. He lived in a van. He had no, he had no real life. My life sucks. I can't believe it. You know, I'm, you know, I haven't done this. And there was this mumbly kind of, and I'm like, this guy, the first time I met him, I'm thinking this guy's good with women. <laughs> this guy. And then we go out to a bar that night and he walks in the bar and he starts doing this weird rocking thing, just gently rocking back and forth. And I'm watching, what's he doing? And you just see this energy starting to come through his body and this light, his eyes light up, his face lights up. And he suddenly looks around and a whole new personality, like, like he was possessed, comes out of him and he grabs the first girl, yanks her over, starts flirting with her. And, it, and this is when I was learning. I was just watching. He's like, Brian, grab me that girl. I'm, and he's talking to this girl. And as I pull this girl over, he turns to her, starts talking to her. And he's just going like a machine, like a bat out of hell. And he's not thinking about shit. And he's got, next thing you know, he's got, Six girls hanging around him. He's flirting up a storm. Everything he does seems to work. And there's like magic flowing out of him. So this is the kind of guy in a dating situation. Mm -hmm. And and all guys that have done a lot of bar game have hit those flow states where they feel like they can do no wrong. This guy could just hit it so consistently. It was like a part of him. Wow. But he was depressed. 
Yeah. Norm was miserable. And he was ruled by his emotions, man. Yeah. It was the same the same feelings that made him strong in the bar scene tore him down when he was on his own. Yeah. Yeah. He would have highs and then crashes, highs and then crashes. So um awesome. Uh Let's do, we're, we're almost an hour and a half. We don't typically go over an hour and a half. Let's do one more last question. And then uh, if you're good with that, and then we'll close out for the day. But yeah. this is awesome so far. So uh, what's our what's our last question, Chance? Um, oh, you got a long one. Uh, Igor again. Uh, in case I get, get lucky with one <laughs> question. Well played, Igor. Well played. Yeah. And how often do you emphasize with your target to the point of questioning your mission or it's an interesting question or is, uh, or is this another one of those, uh, camera, uh, questions? So this is, uh, it's a, it's a really great question. So there, there is a, there is a, uh, event that we call falling in love with our assets in the field. Um, and it's not about romantic love, but it's exactly what Igor is talking about here. When you, connect to your target so closely that you start to question, am I doing the right thing? What I'm doing is, is compromising this person's safety, health, well-being, their whole future in their life, right? Especially if they're like married with kids, they're in a trusted position with their government or with their corporation. And all of a sudden, what I have them doing right now puts all of that at risk. Is it worth ruining this man's life, his family, his children, everything? or this woman's life for a few secrets that help American policymakers have a, an advantage in the negotiation table, right? It's a really, really hard place to be. Uh, and a lot of times what CIA will do is it will keep an eye on us so that it can identify when we, have, when we start to close that empathy gap, when we start to get to a place where we're too close to our asset, and then they'll drive us to do what's known as a turnover, where you basically transition who's in charge of meeting with that asset to someone else. That's a way of institutionalizing the relationship, but it's also a way of making sure that the officers don't get too close to their target. Uh, it absolutely happens. Um, and it's, it is a, it is a difficult place to be when you realize the human impact that an operation is making in a negative way, not just a positive way. Great question. Yeah. If you, I guess it's hard when you got morals and you're asked to do certain things. Yeah. And when you're, I mean, CIA, CIA hires us and vets us to make sure that we are moral grounded, you know, people that are practical and pragmatic and loyal, but just enough outside of the boundaries that we're willing to do this other stuff. So it, you can see how delicate of a dance it is. It's not, it's not that dissimilar to what we're trying to teach your students too, right? You want to be, you want to be vulnerable and authentic and real, but you're also being systematic in how you approach this female. Um, and some at the right point in time, at the wrong point in time, some women might see that as, uh, as, you know, offensive at the right point in time, they'll see it as, you know, productive and constructive and, uh, and empowering, but this is, it's a very similar parallel. We got a lot of gray areas. I'm, I'm guessing you're playing in all the time. And so, um, you know, and, and if you have too much of a conscience, you could live in a lot of regret the rest of your life, you know, right. you a lot of good, but maybe there was a lot of people that got hurt because of the good you did. So that, that creates that gray area. So I don't know if that's been the experience, but yeah, it's absolutely been the experience. And that's why we keep the focus on the intention, right? It, it, you, you'll stay clear of getting into dark gray areas when you remember why you're doing it. Remember that you're keeping Americans safe. You're keeping your family safe. Same thing with, with systematically approaching a female to build a relationship. You are doing it to maximize connection, to maximize your, your uh, value to her as a partner, that's always going to outweigh whether or not you're, you know, pre-planning what you're going to say at the bar in advance, right? This is, this is yeah, this is very interesting. Because um, a lot of my students, they come to me and it takes them a while to really get out of their head and get into their body, get flowing. But I was, I was just thinking about, and this is kind of, maybe I jump topics just a bit here, but I was thinking about the motivation. Here you got a spy, and this spy is under, and we talked about this earlier a bit, spy is under immense pressure, and he's he's got a job that's greater than him. He's serving his country, he's serving his people, he's out there, um, I don't know why uh, Siri's trying to turn on me. Go away, Siri. She heard you say spy. She was interested. Can you still hear me? 
Yeah, you're good, man. Okay. I didn't get that. Could you try again? <laughs> That's Siri. <laughs> she won't shut up. There we go. Or he. There we go. Siri's gone. Uh, just turned on r- randomly. So, um, so this the spy is serving his country. The spy is doing something greater than himself. Hopefully, he's also getting a paycheck. Uh, so there's a lot of lot of stuff that's that's beyond just him and uh, or her and what that person wants. The average client that comes to us wants to get laid. There's a there's a very and what I find was when your focus becomes getting women to get validated, to get laid, just to get laid, to just get validated, just to get something, the the job of teaching you becomes 10 times harder than if you're if you have a greater purpose than you in doing it. Like if you're trying to build a great relationship and make women's lives better, your life better, go out and find a sense of purpose as a man, become powerful as a man, that's a much easier person to teach than the guy who's like, I just want to get laid, I want to feel validated, uh, stroke my ego. Um, do you get those guys? Yeah, I, I, so the thing that's really powerful for me is the, I love, I love getting clients that are tapped into their sexual energy. And when I hear someone say, I just want to get laid or I hear someone say I'm obsessed with sex or I'm a sex addict or whatever it might be. Right. I love talking to those people because what I know is that they have never learned how to transmute their sex energy into anything other than sex energy. And the only way that you transmute that energy is by connecting to a partner who essentially becomes the conduit to transform all of that sexual tension into other productive forms of energy. Had I not met my wife, I don't know what I would be, but I would not be anywhere near as successful as I am now. I wouldn't be as wealthy. I wouldn't be as well known. I wouldn't be as productive because all of my energy was going into getting laid. Once I met my wife, she became my fiance. I trusted her. I loved her. I knew that I could be open and vulnerable with her. All of that sexual energy that used to go into getting laid all of a sudden was free to go do other productive things. And I knew I had a beautiful smoking hot lady who was ready to have sex with me whenever I wanted to, right? Or whenever she wanted to, because one of the best things about a connected relationship is sometimes she comes on to you. So like, that's what I love about connecting these guys who are like, I'm focused on getting laid. Okay, that's cool. Let me show you how to tap into this awesome energy. The folks who come in already knowing they want connection, that's they're three steps ahead of the other guy. They're that much closer to unlocking just unlimited productivity, unlimited energy for the rest of their life. Um, so yeah, the, but for me, it's I, I certainly enjoy both types of people because I know one is just ignorant of the power they have while the other one is that much closer to getting it. I love what you just said because that's 100 percent true. You know, a woman can we can channel our energy into so much creativity because that's what creative energy is. Uh, it's such a beautiful thing. Uh, but what about this? Uh, uh, the guy I think you're talking about is slightly different than the guy I'm talking about. And the reason I say that, and I want to, uh, is because the, a lot of the guys we get are in their heads and they mm-hmm. want to get laid and want to get validated, but they're terrible at getting laid. They never get laid. <laughs> they haven't gotten laid in years. <laughs> And so they're actually pushing women away and that's why they want it so bad. And so, and we help them get past that. And so there's a different, there's a huge frustration in their bodies. And now because they haven't been laid in so long, they want it so bad. That cycle is just becomes Mm. pure pain for them. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. And, and that pain is coming from that pain is another form of energy. So when you can connect them with the skills they need to make the human connection, that takes away the pain of not getting laid, puts that li- getting laid uh, that getting laid priority, and it puts it on any kind of predictable pattern. Oh man, all that pain energy is turned into something productive again, and it's just off to the races. Your yeah. business doubles in a year. Your cur- your three promotions in in two years, right? Whatever. You're traveling the world. You're living life with a smile on your face yeah, because answer. of the because of the human connection, not yeah. just because you got laid. Yeah, yeah. Well, human connection, it's all of it together. Sexual energy, heart energy, all that. So you, you said you weren't going to get spiritual. You got a little spiritual with us. <laughs> Sex is spiritual. What can I say? <laughs> yeah, it's, all, it's all part of this, you know, the whole. So, so um, awesome. It was great having you on the call today. Uh, it, it's actually was super fantastic. And um, we look forward to having you at the Integrated Man Summit talking about sex espionage. For those of you that came in, the call late check out the great man summit there's a link in the chat 
Um, Andrew's going to be talking about sex espionage and uh, and actually do a quick commercial for for your, your integrated man sex espionage because you could say it way better than I can. Is what you were going to talk about. So yeah, you know, no, I, I'm. I'm super excited to get folks to Tim so I can teach them about not just how sex is used in espionage, but how sex is used as a tool by operatives to boost everything from mental clarity to physical health and physical power. And then I'm also super excited because one of the things that's so powerful about sex and espionage is that introverts have a distinct advantage over extroverts which is something that nobody ever anticipates. People think that extroverts have this like edge on how to talk to people and how to be social when in fact they're dead wrong, right? Introverts have a distinct advantage in making conversation, having conversations, controlling conversations, directing conversations when it comes to managing a relationship or, or systematically creating a meaningful connection. Uh, introverts just own the day, but they don't know it because they haven't heard me talk about sex espionage yet. So if you're an introvert, especially, and you think you have some kind of disadvantage in meeting women, Tim's is the place to go. Come to the Integrated Man Summit. I want to teach you about how spies do this because it'll the day after you leave the conference, it'll never be the same. Awesome. That, that sold me. I'm going to be there. <laughs> um, so, guys, definitely check out the link. Put the link back in there for anybody that hasn't seen it. Uh, chance if you can. And uh, if you want to do it online, too, we have an online version. If you want to be part of the VIP group, which is the private talk, uh, with everybody that's going to be speaking at the Integrated Man Summit, your chance to ask Andrew some of these uh, sex be honest questions off camera, so nobody sees it, nobody hears what your question is. That's a uh, 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 something that I would take advantage of right away because I'm sure that will sell out very, very quickly. Um, so again, Andrew, I want to thank you for being on the call. It was awesome having you. Uh, maybe we can have you on again before uh, Tim's. We'll see because Tim's a little ways away. Uh, and would you guys like that? Oh, oh, I think you guys would like that. I, I was watching the <laughs> chat and everybody was really happy. So, um, I just got a huge ego boost when he said the introvert thing. <laughs> so, uh, is this video uploaded on YouTube already? So yeah, so guys really want to watch it. Yeah. Uh, I'm here anytime. And it's, I mean, this is exactly where I want to be, right? Helping people change their life, bring it on. It's, this is where the fun happens. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what it's about. It makes me feel, uh, it, it, the more I do this every year, the uh, the more it changes my life. So uh, I got to be honest, maybe that's in the wrong direction, but there's a bit of selfishness in it too. <laughs> so, um, okay, guys, have a beautiful day and we'll see you in the uh, next video. And remember, only the confident really live.